This is going to be an overview of the book of Galatians. Now, the book of Galatians, the author is the Apostle Paul. And the historical time is 57 AD. This epistle has six chapters, 149 verses, and around 3,084 words. The theme is Christ our Liberty. And Galatians means Gauls. Uh, his, the historical application, Paul addresses the false gospel of legalism. The doctrinal application is, this epistle shows us that we are kept saved by grace through faith. Just like Romans shows us we're saved by grace through faith, uh, Galatians shows us that we're kept saved by grace through faith. You had all these people going around that were saying you were kept saved by being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses and by doing good works. But this epistle doctrinally shows you that you're kept saved by grace through faith. Now, chapter 1. In chapter 1, Paul lays down the authority of the gospel. He explains how he got his doctrine from Jesus Christ himself and didn't get it from flesh and blood. And he says in Galatians 1, 3 through 4, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, John three sixteen. He voluntarily laid down his life when he didn't have to. He didn't give... Uh, he didn't get anything from us, but he gave his life for us. True love is giving. And John fifteen thirteen says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The most true love ever was shown at the cross. The father laying down the life of his son. The son giving his own life voluntarily for us. Knowing what Jesus did for you should make you never want to stray away from the gospel. Like the Corinthians were straying away from the true gospel. If you know what Jesus did for you, you shouldn't ever want to stray away from the true gospel. You shouldn't want to add anything to it. Because Jesus Christ loved you enough to shed his blood and die for you. What more could you add to that? Even Why even listen to people who want to add or subtract from that? Imagine if you died for somebody... And you were the only reason that they're alive today is because you died for that person. Imagine if they were going around saying, well, yeah, he died for me, but if it wasn't also for this and this and this and that, I really wouldn't be alive. I mean, he did die for me, but it was also because of this and this and this. Imagine how you would feel if people was going around claiming all these other things had to do with them still being alive today. When you're the one that laid down their life, you're the one that jumped in front of a bullet. You're the one that pushed them out of the way of a, a train coming on a train track and ended up getting hit. You know, you gave your life for that person, but they're going around adding all these other things. Or maybe even saying, well, I saved myself. Imagine if you took a bullet for somebody and they're going around saying, yeah, you did take a bullet, but the reason they're alive is because of himself. You see how crazy that is? The Galatians were having this problem, and that is what Paul was having to get on to them about. And he says in verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul can't believe it. And he just marvels at how they have been so quickly deceived by someone concerning the gospel. In Galatians 1, seven, he says, Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So you can pervert the gospel of Christ. It's laid out clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Paul explains how, he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul clearly and simply lays out the gospel for us. And clearly says to beware of anyone who tries to add to it. In Galatians 1.8 and Galatians 1.9 he says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, 
preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So Paul even includes himself in that. He says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, that shows that a, a Christian can end up teaching a false gospel. And uh, you see, you can be you can believe the gospel and be saved, and then get messed up by somebody, and in turn start preaching to others a false gospel. So just because somebody's uh, preaching a false gospel doesn't automatically mean that that person's lost, because they could have believed the gospel at one point and truly been saved. And then be deceived and led astray by somebody, just like the Galatians were. And that's why Paul says, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. And or an angel. Angels do come with perverted gospels. One came to Joseph Smith and gave him the Mormon doctrine. People claim to see angels all the time. Peter tells us in First Peter one nineteen that we have a more sure word of prophecy, though. So I don't need an angel to tell me anything because I've got the words of God. They, the word of God is complete. They have instructed me. They've, the, the Bible has given me the right gospel. And with these words, I have a guide. I don't need dreams and visions and angels and false prophets and psychics and all this other stuff to tell me. I've got the words. I have a more sure word of prophecy. I don't need angels to come down and give me all this extra information. I'm struggling to understand all the information in the Bible itself right now. If you, if they were to just come down and give me a whole bunch more information, it's, it's just a work overload for me. It's going to take me a lifetime to understand the Bible that I do have. It's just funny to me that all these people are getting all these prophecies all the time, getting on YouTube, on these YouTube videos, saying, oh, I, an angel came to me in a dream. An angel gave me this prophecy. Uh, I got this news. The rapture is going to be next week. The rapture is going to be next month. Okay, you, these angels are giving you all these prophecies, yet you don't even know the prophecies that are in the Bible itself. That just doesn't make any sense to me. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He says in verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul's not about pleasing men. He isn't a people pleaser. He's a God pleaser. He's not going to change the gospel to get a bigger income. He's not going to change the gospel to get out of being persecuted. He's going to preach the truth. He has a zeal for the truth. He says in verse 13, for ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Paul was in the Jews' religion. Before he was saved, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He would torture and imprison Christians who believed the same thing that he believes now. And he says, And he profited in the Jews' religion, above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, you see, it pleased God to separate Paul from his mother's womb. It's a pleasure of God for a baby to be born. If you exterminate the baby, then you're taking away the pleasure of God. It's his, it's his pleasure for them to be born. And Paul is about to explain the things he is preaching didn't come from man. He got direct revelations from God. So, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So, the moment when Paul got saved, he didn't confer with flesh and blood. He didn't confer with men. He, and then he says in verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. He didn't even go to the apostles. He says, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. So he didn't go and consult with the apostles about the mysteries and all the stuff that he reveal, has revealed to us in his epistles. It says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. So he went and got by himself for three years. And Paul, uh, God gave him all these revelations. So he went up to see Peter after the three years and abode with him 15 days. And he says, But other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. 
So Paul got all kinds of revelations from the Lord directly in those three years, just like Moses did when he went up on the mount. He took three years, Paul took three years, and God was his Bible teacher. And God laid out the Bible for him. God gave him more stuff. You see, he's not doing that no more because we've got a complete Bible. Paul wrote a lot of the Old Testament. Me and you are not writing the Bible. We don't need God to come down and give us extra revelation. But then, after the three years, Paul was able to talk to Peter. He was able to talk to James, the Lord's brother. This way, he could hear all kinds of stories about the Lord's earthly ministry. He, uh, James, the Lord's brother, could have told him all about stuff about Jesus that's not even written in the Bible for, that we know of today. Just about Jesus growing up. About and, and Peter could have told him all about walking and talking with Jesus for three years there. And you see, this sets a principle for us that before Paul went to man to learn anything about Jesus Christ, Paul got by himself and got with God alone to learn about Jesus Christ. So that's a principle for us. For example, when I do a chapter of the Bible, I'll go through the chapter, get everything out of it that I can, that God can give me, and then I'll listen to somebody preach on it. I'll listen to somebody teach on it. I'll look at a commentary on it. But if you can get in it for yourself, God can really speak to you before those men speak to you. But it's good to have both. And that, that'll help keep you from, from getting into false doctrine too. If you look at the chapter first, get a concordance, get Esau or something like that. You go through the chapter yourself, and then you listen to somebody preach and teach on it. That way you have an idea what's in it. You can know if that person's trying to deceive you or not. Or that person can actually correct you. Maybe you were wrong. You were deceived. And then you hear that person say something and correct you, and it just opens your eyes about it. God can use, use it that way. But that sets a good Bible principle there. Uh, let God teach you first. Let God give you all he's going to give you on it, and then get a commentary, then get a teaching on it. Now, chapter 2, Paul meets with Peter, James, and John about the gospel. And he's preaching the right gospel, and he wants to make sure all these other guys are on the same page. In Galatians 2, 3 through 5, you're going to see Titus. It says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily despite our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, who, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. You see, circumcision was the big thing when Paul was going around. Today, the th big thing for people is water baptism. When Paul was preaching, you had false teachers going around saying you must be bab or you must be circumcised, keep the law of Moses, and believe on Christ. They say you got to believe on Christ, but after that, to stay saved, you got to make sure you're circumcised and keeping the law of Moses. They were adding to the gospel. They didn't believe you were kept saved by grace through faith. So Paul gave them give them a place. No, not for an hour. He says. You know, he says they came in privily to spy out, spy out our liberty that they might bring us back into bondage. You see, if you're going by the law, that's just putting you back under bondage. But Paul was bold in preaching the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, preaching that for salvation, and preaching by grace through faith to keep salvation. He proclaimed that if you put your trust in the gospel to save you, then you're saved. And Peter, James, and John all agree with Paul on the same gospel. So it says in verse 9, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. There's why you shake hands. There's the right hands of fellowship, that we should go into the heathen and they into the circumcision. <clears throat> now this doesn't mean that they had a, a, a gospel, one gospel to Gentiles and one to Jews, it's that uh, Paul was primarily preaching 
primarily, not only, but primarily the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter primarily the apostle to the circumcision, the Jews. Doesn't mean they got two different gospels. They're preaching the same gospel. They just, they're going to two different people primarily. But that doesn't mean that's the only people they go to because we know, I mean, who just, uh, who's Paul's heavy burden for? His kinsmen according to the flesh. He says, you know, he talks about them in Romans 9 through 11. But he says in Galatians 2, 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And what a great verse. You should have that verse memorized. It's just a clear verse. You aren't justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So you're not justifying yourself by your good works. <clears throat> he says in verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh shall live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you are crucified with Christ. And when you got saved, your body died in a doctrinal sense. In the eyes of God, your body died. It got crucified with Christ. You no longer have to serve the flesh because every morning you reckon it to be dead. Every day you reckon yourself dead. You die daily. It says in Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism, that's the spirit baptism, into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So my flesh is dead. Now I'm to walk in the Spirit. And if I live by the faith of the Son of God, then I'm going to walk clean. I'm not going to walk in the flesh. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He says in Galatians 2.21. That's a great verse. And it's basically saying if you could get righteousness, if you could get salvation through keeping the law, then didn't Jesus die in vain? What was the point of Jesus Christ dying in your place if you could earn your own righteousness? It's just spitting in the face of, of Jesus Christ. It's like I said, you know, pretend that I jumped in front of a bullet. I'm the only reason you're alive. Yet you say it, you're alive because of yourself. That doesn't make any sense. But that's what you're doing when you say, well, well, I believed on Jesus Christ, but I'm earning my way. I'm earning my way to heaven by living a good life every day and doing the right things. I'm saving myself. That's, that's crazy talk. Chapter 3, you got salvation by faith, grace versus law, and the purpose of the law. And he's starting off, talking to the Galatians here. It says in Galatians 3, 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. So notice these gospel perverts are going around bewitching the Galatians. They charmed them. They fascinated them to the point that they forgot the simple, clear gospel that Paul had given them. He says in verse 2, This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You know, did they get saved and get indwelt by the Spirit of God by doing the works of the law or by faith? They got it by faith. So why would they think they were kept saved by the law or by getting circumcised? If you didn't deserve salvation to begin with, if God gave you salvation and you didn't deserve it when you got it, or you didn't get it by the works of the law to begin with, then why would you think you deserve it or get it by the works of the law after you have it? Why would you think you're kept saved by keeping the law or because you deserve it? If you, weren't, if you didn't get it because you were keeping the law or because you deserve it to begin with. That doesn't make any sense. So Paul says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? If you are saved now... Then are you made perfect by your own flesh? That's foolish. You can't do anything good enough to perfect a perfect salvation. 
It says in Galatians 3, 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, just like Abraham got imputed righteousness before he was circumcised and before the law, you get imputed righteousness without being circumcised or by keeping the law. Know you therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. A great thing about this verse is that it says the scripture preached before the gospel unto Abraham. So this is referring to Genesis. At that time, Abraham had no scripture. This shows that Paul has the scripture lifted up pretty high and he and sees the scripture as the very words of God. And the gospel preached to Abraham was in thee shall all nations be blessed. In Galatians 3.11, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Paul makes it ever so clear. No man, no man is ever justified by the law in the sight of God. It's all by faith. He even says himself, it is evident. It is evident. That means it's plain, open to be seen, clear to the naked eye. It is ever so plain that the just shall live by faith. It is so evident that the devil has to blind you to deceive you of that truth, deceive you from believing that truth. It says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So you're saved by grace through faith without works. The works you did, good or bad, even the good works, even the bad works, before and after salvation have absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. The works you do after salvation are nothing more than an issue of discipleship. You can be saved and not be a good disciple. There's a lot of saved people that aren't good disciples. It says in Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus Christ became the curse. He became sin. He became our serpent on a pole. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It says in 1 Peter 2.24, Who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. Jesus became the curse. He became our serpent on a pole. It says in Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law showed you that you were a sinner and that you couldn't be righteous enough. Galatians 3.25, But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Notice that after that faith has come. You see, they had faith in the Old Testament, but it's obviously a different faith in the New Testament. And that's why it says after that faith has come. Obviously, in the Old Testament, they weren't believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross because that hadn't even happened yet. But now I'm saved and kept saved by believing on Jesus Christ. And in Galatians 3, 26 through 27, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And this is the spirit baptism, which has absolutely nothing to do with water. The moment I believed, I was baptized into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ we are one. In Christ we are neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male or female. Now, with that being said, physically, you are still a male or a female. You can't use this verse to say, well, I can be whatever I want to be or we're all just trans, trans neutral or whatever. Physically, you still are what you are. You're still a male or female. You're still a Jew or a Gentile. You're still bond or free. But if you're saved in Christ, we are one. And it doesn't go by national distinction and all that. And that's how you know that the body ain't going through the tribulation. Because if you look in the book of Revelation, it's going by that. It's all about Israel again. You're seeing 144,000 uh, of the all from the tribes of Israel. That's one way you know the body's not going through the tribulation. Because it goes back to God dealing with Israel. 
He's not dealing with Israel right now. He's dealing with the church, which is neither Jew nor Greek. Chapter 4 is about sons and heirs and about the example of Sarah and Hagar. You know, Sarah and Hagar, Abraham's wives and back there in Genesis. And it says in Galatians 4.22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. So Abraham had two sons. That's Ishmael and Isaac. Those two sons picture your life. Ishmael pictures your first birth. It was no good. Isaac pictures your second birth. Your second birth is what got you in. That's your new birth. Just like Ishmael, Ishmael wouldn't be the heir. He was the first son. But the second son, Isaac, would be the heir. Your second birth when you got born again, that's what got you in. Ishmael, uh, his mother was the bondmaid. That would be Hagar. She is associated with the law. Notice that it calls her a bondmaid. If you're trying to keep the law, what are you doing? You're bringing yourself back into bondage. Now, the free woman is Abraham's wife, Sarah. From her comes Isaac. Galatians 4.23, But he who is of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Ishmael is after the flesh. Isaac was by promise. Your first birth was a fleshy birth. Your second birth, that's what got you in when you were baptized into the body of Christ. So you see the picture there. And it says, Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. Uh, notice two things. Agar is Hagar, obviously. She's a bondmaid. She reminds you of bondage, just like the law. Notice it says the one from the Mount Sinai. It says Hagar from Mount Sinai. That's where Moses got the law. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Notice how the other covenant, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So New Jerusalem is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she with ha hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of the promise. Just like Isaac was a child of promise, me and you are a child of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. And how did he persecute him? He mocked him. So mocking is a form of persecution. So you may not be being burned at the stake. You may not be being hung upside down on a cross and crucified. But if somebody's mocking you for your faith, you're being persecuted. All that live, will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be made heir with the son of the free woman. Just like, you know, it's saying you know, Abraham back there in Genesis, he cast out the bondwoman. He cast out Hagar and her son Ishmael. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, chapter 5, stand fast in liberty, in liberty, but don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. You've got liberty as a child of God, but don't abuse this liberty. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So we aren't sons of the bondwoman. I'm not a slave to the law. I'm free and have liberty in Jesus Christ. If I start thinking I have to do certain things to keep my salvation, then I'm entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul says in verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. In the context, this doesn't mean that circumcised people can't be saved. This is referring to people who are relying on their physical circumcision or some good work. If they've just been relying on that to save them, then Jesus isn't profit, profiting them nothing. If you're relying on something else other than Jesus Christ, 
then it, Jesus is not going to profit you. You have to put your trust on him. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is debtor to do the whole law. If they were relying on their circumcision to save them, they also have to remember that to establish a righteousness good enough to get eternal life, they would have to keep the whole law from birth to death. The only man who ever did everything perfectly was Jesus Christ. But we're all born with a, a sin nature. We, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody's keeping the law perfectly. Nobody ever has except the Lord Jesus. It says in James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. If, they, if they're circumcised and they step out in some other part of the law, I mean, they're still guilty of all. Galatians 5, 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. The, now, this verse is commonly used to prove that you can lose your salvation. But it actually goes against what they're trying to say. Because that's not what it's saying at all. It's going against what they're trying to teach. If you've never trusted Christ, but instead you're putting your trust in keeping the law to be saved, then you've fallen from grace. If you're putting your trust in your own works, that's not what salvation is about. Now there's people who, they when they got saved, they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were just trusting in that. They weren't relying on their own goodness to get them to heaven. But then later on, like the Galatians, they were deceived into thinking that they had to keep the law to be saved you know they're still saved they're just deceived and teaching a false gospel because they're deceived but there are also people who never trusted in christ that's always trusted in their works and if you're just trusted in your works then then you're you're the one that's fallen from grace galatians 5 7 you did run well who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth so who hindered bewitched and got the Galatians so off track. Well, it was people perverting the gospel, coming in and adding works to the gospel. That's who is hindering them. Galatians 5.13, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You have people who say, well, you believe in once saved, always saved, so you just believe you can go out and do whatever you want to do all the time. But I have never thought that. I've never actually heard a preacher say that or any Christian say that who believes once saved, always saved. They must, uh, they must be thinking that's what they would do if they believed once saved, always saved. They must, that must be what they would do if they believed in eternal security. But Paul comes back and makes it very clear. He says, Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't abuse your liberty. And just do the sinful things your flesh wants to do just because you have eternal security. It says in Galatians 5.14, For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see, if you love God and you love everyone else around you more than yourself, then you're going to have no problem keeping God's laws. If you love your brother, then you're going, you're going to treat him right. You're not going to steal his stuff. You're not going to kill him, obviously. You're not going to take his wife or any of that stuff. You're not going to commit adultery with his wife. You know, if you love your neighbor, you're going to fulfill the law in one word. You're not going to have any problem keeping the law. And you have to walk in the Spirit. Every morning when you get up, say to yourself that you've been crucified with Christ. Your flesh is dead, and now you're going to walk in the Spirit. Don't let the flesh guide the way. Paul says in Galatians 5.16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So you have a split personality in a, in a way. Your flesh says do the wrong thing, and the Spirit says do the right thing. And Paul says in verse 18, But if you let be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, 
variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, of such and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, one of those I want to point out, which I always like to point out, is heresies. Because you got a lot of people, a lot of Christians that they want to go around saying that if somebody teaches something wrong, whatever it is, they say, well, that person's lost because they teach such and such. Well, heresies is a work of the flesh, and all these works of the flesh, it's possible for a Christian to commit these because they still have the flesh. It's possible for a Christian to walk in the flesh, teach heresies, just like the Galatians were believing these heresies and most likely teaching these heresies that they had been taught even though they were saved. And all of these things are things that a Christian can commit, but you should you should try your best not to. Don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. If you do these things, then you're going to lose your inheritance. You're not going to lose your salvation, but you'll lose your inheritance. It says that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Losing your inheritance is not the same as losing your salvation. You're going to lose rewards, crowns, your... your you're not going to get as many cities in the kingdom. It says in Galatians 5, and 23, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Notice it is the fruit of the Spirit and not the fruits of the Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit, then you're going to have love and joy and peace and long-suffering, and gentleness, and goodness, and faith, and meekness, and temperance. You know, if you're going around being hateful to everybody, telling everybody off, being impatient, and a jerk, are you showing love? If you're complaining all the time, are you showing joy? Are you showing peace, and long-suffering when you're so impatient, and gentleness when you're screaming at the top of your lungs at people, and goodness, and faith, and meekness, and temperance. Most Christians are not showing the fruit of the Spirit, but they're walking in the flesh, even though they're not getting drunk, doing witchcraft, and idolatry, in the sense that they think idolatry is. They're not murdering nobody. They're not committing adultery and fornicating. But they're definitely not having the fruit of the Spirit going on. If you walk in the flesh, then you're going to love yourself. You're not going to love yourself more than your neighbor. You're going to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do that, you're going to fulfill all the law. You're not going to abstain from all those sins Paul just listed. You're going to commit sin eventually because you still have the flesh. But at the rapture, you're going to get a new body and you're not going to have to worry about the sins of the flesh anymore. Now, chapter 6. This chapter is about bearing burdens, restoring one another, and about how you're going to reap what you sow. You see, it says, bear one another's burdens. But then it says, let every man bear his own burden. And what that shows you is, you, you can help somebody so much but then he's going to have to bear his own burden. If you can continue if you continue to bear his burden for him, then you're actually making him worse. Every man's got to bear his own burden eventually. You can't keep someone up forever. You can't keep giving them money and food and everything else. Galatians 6:3 says for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. If you think you're good enough to earn your way to heaven or keep yourself saved, you're just deceiving yourself. And it says in Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You may not reap it tomorrow, but mark it down, you'll reap it eventually. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. If you do bad things, then you're going to reap bad things. If you do good things, you're going to reap good things. 
It says in Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Doing good and keeping the flesh down can be exhausting. It can make you weary. But in due season you're going to reap. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of their household of faith. Do good to every man. Be nice to everybody. Everybody's having a hard time. Everybody is a person, just like you. But especially do good to the house of faith, the household of faith. Especially to your saved brothers and sisters in Christ. But this has been the Galatians overview.